Today I want to talk a little bit more about kinetics and I want to talk about elementary reactions, mechanisms for reactions, and rate limiting or rate determining steps. So I'm going to use those terms somewhat interchangeably in this video. Um, rate limiting or rate determining and they both, both mean the same thing but just that there's one step in the process that's going to determine the overall rate of the process and we'll kind of get into that in later a little bit later in the video. All right, so let's introduce elementary reactions here. Um, as the name sort of implies, it's really just a single, simple molecular event. You have reactants, they form products. I know that that sounds like a lot of chemical reactions, but realistically, there are a lot of chemical reactions that go through a number of different steps in order to get to the final product. So there's a lot of different mechanisms in there, but if you just have one singular molecular event, you have diatomic chlorine, it splits apart into two chlorine atoms. That's an elementary reaction. Now you can rely on a book or problems or homework or your professor to tell you that something is an elementary reaction. It's not something you'd necessarily, as introductory or general chemistry kind of students, uh, it's not something you'd be able to necessarily know about a process unless you're given that information. So if it specifies that it's an elementary process, then you have different rules when it comes to the rate law expression. So our rate law expression is that the rate is equal to some constant K times the concentrations of your reactants raised to certain powers, but we said those powers have to be experimentally determined with uh, a number of experimental data. Now with an elementary process I don't need experimental data. I can tell you what the power is going to be because it's going to be based on how many are reacting in that particular reaction. So it's actually easier to figure out the rate law expressions for elementary reactions as it should be, right? That's sort of hence the elementary part. So uh, let's talk about what this looks like then. So if I have a process here in equilibrium where my chlorine, my diatomic elemental chlorine is forming into two chlorine atoms, then I, and this process is in equilibrium and I can tell that because I have a forward reaction and a reverse reaction shown with my reversible arrows here. I could talk about the rate of the forward reaction. So let's just call that rate one and that's gonna be equal to K1 and let's put my K over this arrow like that. So that's gonna be the rate law constant for this forward reaction. And it's gonna be times the concentration of my chlorine. And there's only one of them, one diatomic chlorine that is reacting. So I'm raising it to the first power. So it's gonna be based on the number that are reacting. Now, if I think about the rate of my reverse reaction, so now I'm talking about these two chlorine atoms forming my diatomic chlorine, then let's talk about this rate as a minus one because I'm kind of going in opposite directions here. So it's still the same reaction, but I'm going in the opposite direction. So I'll call that a K minus one. So the rate in the reverse reaction here is equal to my rate constant times my concentration of chlorine atoms squared. And again, that squared comes from the two as a coefficient. And because it's an elementary reaction, then I know that that coefficient matters. The number of reactants matters. So we would say that this is a unimolecular reaction going in the forward direction and a bimolecular reaction going in the reverse re direction because it's all about the number of reactants and that number of reactants is going to give you the overall order of the reaction. And it doesn't get much more than term molecular, which is three of our reactants because when you get into more than that, then it gets a little more complicated. It tends to have more mechanisms at that point. So three is really kind of the, the limiting point. Okay, let's take the second one here. So let's say that this is the rate of my second reaction. And if I wanted to do the rate law expression for this, then it's going to be the rate constant for this particular process. And then it's going to be times the concentration of my chlorine atom times the concentration of my CHCl3. And there's one of each of those in this process. So these are each raised to the one power and that would be my rate expression for this elementary process. Now let's look at the third one. Let's call this K3 because this is my third process. So the rate of this process is equal to some constant K times the 
concentration of my chlorine atom times the concentration of my carbon trichloride. And again, one to one, so we have those there. So these two would be bimolecular processes because I only have two reactants for each. All right, now, if you remember your Hess's law, then your Hess's law says we can add together individual reactions in order to figure out information about an overall process. And so when we're thinking about this in terms of kinetics, then the rates of the individual steps are gonna impact the rate of the overall process. So I could write an overall reaction for this if I add these guys together. And remember when you're adding together chemical reactions, then you add everything that's together on the reactant side and then everything that's on the product side. So my overall is gonna be my Cl2 plus two Cl's plus a CHCl3 plus CCl3, and all of that is gonna give me two chlorines, hydrochloric acid, CCl3, and CCl4. Okay. Now, if you recall from what we've added before, if I have the same thing on both sides, then we would say that that's an intermediate. So it's something that formed along the way that then got used up along the way. And that kind of speaks to what we're talking about here with the rate determining step is that depending on how fast these processes are happening, these each individual elementary processes are happening are going to impact the overall rate of the process. So if I want to identify my intermediates here, then I have two chlorines here, two here. I have a CCL3 on each side. So my overall reaction then is going to be Cl2 plus CHCl3 gives me HCl and CCl4. Okay. Now the rate of this process, now that it's not an elementary process, my rate law expression is gonna be equal to some constant K times the concentration of my chlorine, now raised to some power, times my concentration of my CHCl3 raised to some power. And again, I wouldn't know what these powers are. I can't tell just based on how many there are. I'd have to have some more experimental data, or I would have to have information about the rates along the way in order to um, figure out this rate of the process. Okay, so what we're talking about here is that we're trying to determine kind of what this rate of the overall process is from the individual pieces. Okay, that's where we're going with this. Let's look at an example. Now this rate determining step or the rate limiting step is the slowest step in the reaction. And you have to be given information about the speed of these things in order to determine um, the overall rate of the process. So there is that kind of extra piece that you need to have to figure out those, this, how the rates are all related to the final. So if we have these following elementary steps, so for this particular reaction, then it's asking me to find the overall reaction, just like we did with that first example, and then to figure out the rate law expression for the overall reaction. Okay, so let's start with the um, thinking about the rates for each of the steps along the way first, and then we'll figure out our overall reaction, and then we can figure out how that's all interconnected. So we can see here that we're given some information about each of the steps. The first step is fast and in equilibrium. So we have Equilibrium meaning that the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. That's what equilibrium tells us in a chemical system. So we can say then that the rate in the forward direction, which is my K1 times my NO squared, is equal to the rate in the reverse direction, which is my K times my concentration of N2O2. Okay, so this is an equality that I can get from the fact that this is an equilibrium. So this is my rate one going in the forward direction. This is my rate negative one going in the reverse direction. When the rates of two opposing processes are equal, we're in equilibrium. Now this is happening fast, so this isn't going to be the one that limits my overall process, but this might be important information as we go. Let's look at this next one. This next one is slow, so we know this rate is going to impact our overall reaction. So let's call this K2. So we know that the rate here, 
is going to be equal to K2. And again, these are elementary reactions, so I can take into account how many there are. So that I have the concentration of my N2O2 times the concentration of my hydrogen, and that gives me this rate. Now, the third step is fast, so it also is not going to have much of an impact on my overall rate, but let's just figure out our rate just for practice. So we'll call this K3, and then I have N2O, and a concentration of hydrogen. Okay, again, one to one, so we raise these to the first powers. They're elementary reactions, so we're just taking into account how many I have. All right, now let's add together everything I have on my reactant side and everything I have on my product side. So here's my overall process. So I have 2NO plus N2O2 plus two of my hydrogens plus N2O gives me N2O2 plus N2O plus water, two of them plus nitrogen. Okay, now the next step is to identify my intermediates. So these again are the things that form along the way but um, we're used up in the process. So I have N2O2 on both sides. I have N2O on both sides. So that leaves me with an overall process of 2NO plus two hydrogens gives me two waters and a nitrogen. So if I'm writing the rate for this process, then again, it's not an elementary reaction anymore. So I know it's going to be some constant K times my concentration of nitrogen monoxide raised to some power times my concentration of hydrogen raised to some power. And again, I don't know what those powers are without having some more information. Now, if I'm thinking about rate determining, then my rate is going to be determined by my slowest step. It's that weakest link thing. So the, the slowest of my steps is going to be the rate of my overall reaction. So my overall reaction is really because of this slow bit, this is the rate of the overall reaction. Now that's problematic because of this piece right here. This piece right here says that the rate of the overall reaction is going to be dependent on the concentration of something that isn't in my final reaction, right? So my concentration of my N2O2 is not even part of this. So I need to figure out a way to substitute out this piece that isn't in my final rate expression and put something in that is. So what I need to do is find a relationship between N2O2 and nitrogen monoxide, NO. And handily enough, and this will be the case, in your equilibrium step, you have a way to solve for one from the other. So if I want to replace this guy, I need to solve this one in terms of my concentration of N2O2. So here's my N2O2 concentration, and that's going to be equal to my constant in the forward reaction over my constant to my reverse reaction times the concentration of my nitrogen monoxide squared. So now I can put this in for this guy, and now I get a rate expression that says that the rate is equal to um, K2, because that's coming from here, and then I'm going to substitute in my concentration of N2O2, so this is going to be K2 times K1 all over K to the minus 1 times the concentration of NO squared, again, coming from here, and then times the concentration of my hydrogen that's coming from this guy. So that one's okay. That just tells me that my N here is equal to 1, and I found out that my M is equal to 2 based on the relationship between my, my N2O2 and my NO. All right, now, uh, this is kind of ugly. If you have all of these Ks, then you can substitute them in. Oftentimes, you can just combine together the Ks since they're all a constant, so you end up with a final expression that looks like this. Second order with respect to nitrogen monoxide, first order with respect to hydrogen. And again, you have to get that 